Amen. Good to see you again. Hope you had a good lunch. Did you? All right. That's always good. The old proverb we used to say in Missouri, when the belly is full, the body needs rest. So let's not uh, fulfill that proverb here. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think uh, I've got some handouts uh, you've been given. Hopefully you're, we had enough for everyone. Uh, just to kind of uh, recap what we're talking about here is uh, the restoration movement. And on your handouts, I'm going to review that first part for everyone that maybe didn't get a chance to be here, just so we can kind of stay up to speed on some things. Okay. But um, page one, we talked about defining some terms and uh, restoration and reformation. Okay, reformation. Uh, we always think of the movement of Martin Luther uh, reforming uh, the church. We're out of handouts. Yeah. Okay. And then on there, you can email me or uh, I'll try to put it up on our website, but probably better to email me and I'll send you a copy of the handout. And that way you can have one. Um, if you got if you didn't hear the first part and you get the tape that way or the CD, that way you can hear a little bit, follow along with the handouts. But what we try to do is, is reform, reformation was to reform uh, what was currently existing as a church. Um, uh, changing it, yes. Um, but uh, Martin Luther was one of those that... He wasn't interested in throwing out what the Catholic Church had done. He was interested in reforming, trying to find what was good. And what Martin Luther did was he challenged uh, the wickedness. Uh, you know, we don't read about the other stuff that was going on in other places where priests were challenging the Catholic Church to change in certain areas. Uh, but we do uh, know Martin Luther probably is the most common for us. Um, the thing about it is, did they completely bring back the New Testament Church? I think they were trying to, but... A lot of things that they, uh, they weren't able to do. Uh, one thing I can think of is when I first was baptized in um, 1983, I was 21, I, I had grown up in the Lutheran church some. My dad was an atheist, and my mom uh, kind of took me to church some, but I ended up settling in there. And when I was uh, converted, I went back and read some of Martin Luther's writings that I remember as a kid uh, being taught in catechism. And one of the things about Martin Luther is Martin Luther believed baptism was necessary to become a Christian. But they, they uh, sprinkled infants. And he, his rationale was, as I, you know, because the pedo Baptists were harassing him over the immersion issue. And he preferred immersion. But one of the things Martin Luther said was, I look back at all these people who are baptized as infants and I see the fruit they're producing. And so I have to believe that they're working through God. So, you know, you know what was happening? Well, he wasn't really going all the way back to restoring the New Testament. He was working with what he had. Was it right? Uh, no, he was placing more emphasis on what he saw God doing in a movement rather than sticking with the scriptural issues. But that's kind of the idea of Reformation. A lot of the people reforming the church uh, you know, may not have been as close to God as, as uh, we think they were. But as a historian, it's not my business to judge. You know, So that's what Reformation is. Restoration <clears throat> typically has been understood as let's dump it all and go back to the early church. Acts chapter 2, you know, and refound the church or restore the church. The thing about it is when people do that, we ignore 2,000 years of history. and We tend to make the same mistakes that they made over time. Uh, secondly, we never really do restore the church because we still have our own preoccupations. Uh, yeah. um, and we were talking at lunch with some guys. One of the things that I bring up is in Christianity, we have a preoccupation with the crucifixion. And when you read the book of Acts, the preoccupation was with the resurrection. Um, Mel Gibson's The Passion is a prime example of that. That has swept the religious community. And what, what made me angry was it's about the resurrection. You know, um, In our domestic violence work, our abuse work, you know, we're finding all of these priests who've been pedophiles. Yeah, they focus on the crucifixion. See, focusing on the crucifixion brings about shame and humiliation and you know, power and control. Resurrection is about empowering people and saying, you know, we're, we're helping you to do this and you know, we lose a sense of control over that. So, you know, again, uh, you, know, you can just see even in, in all of our attempts to restore the New Testament church, um, we find ourselves keeping some of the things from what's you know, our religious teachings, our religious understandings. 
So the idea of reformation is actually a progressive movement to try to change what's going on and asking the question, what needs to change each time we go? Um, I, I mentioned in the first session about Acts chapter 1, verse 6, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? You know, God took the same group of people who were sinners, uh, brought them back to Babylon, reworked with that community, reformed that community, the book of Ezekiel and Jeremiah, gave them a new covenant and continued on. So um, the early reformers or the people on the, the restoration movement saw themselves as reformers. Alexander Campbell, as we mentioned, one of the re, uh, re, people in our restoration movement, his New Testament translation from the Greek, he, he translated repent as reform. Uh, he saw himself as part of the Reformed Baptists at one time. Some of the people in the restoration movement called themselves Reformed Methodists earlier in the 1700s. So they saw themselves as a reformation. Walter Scott, Alexander Campbell's right-hand man, his nickname was Philip. That was Martin Luther's right-hand man, you see. So you know, they saw themselves as reformers, um, but they, called, they used restoration terminology. You know, they weren't trying to throw everything out and go back and start with Acts 2. They said, we as a church need to go back to the way they did it in the Bible. And so they were moving that direction. So the restoration movement was a movement. Ideas, philosophies, theology, um, actions for God, all done in a movement per, uh, together. Some terms that are there on that first page, mainline churches of Christ, um, is the ones that are not ICC, International Churches of Christ. We are the typical, what we've known as the churches of Christ. Um, my title is uh, main, uh, from the mainline churches of Christ, so I thought I'd define that for you. Um, uh, Christian churches are, are the churches of Christ that use instrumental music. Uh, a little bit different in some of their theology, but mostly very similar. Disciples of Christ uh, is a term now that refers to the first Christian church. A little more liberal than the Christian churches, but they also practice uh, uh, instrumental music. A movement, I define that. And then I talked about our view of history. And you saw on the bottom of your page there that typically we look at history as, you know, my way was right and everybody else that breaks off is a rebel. You know, the voices of dissension are rebels. Uh, and it's based upon the perspective of the historian. You know, whoever's writing the book. Uh, I've got a bibliography there on your last page. And, you know, it depends on the perspective of the writer. You're going to read a lot of things different in each book because it depends on the perspective of the writer. Some writers will say we were right and we're going to tell you about all the people that were breaking off of us. Uh, others take a different view. And that's on the back of that first page the more confusing view that the only way I could think of is that we look at all that was going on and we talk about the voices and the prophets and the people who were speaking forth a message and instead of saying ah what a bunch of rebels we say why were they saying this you know what was being said they were trying to call us to reform they were trying to call us to go back to the way they did it in the Bible they were trying to alert us to issues that were going on that we really didn't know and you know, the, the separation between the churches of Christ and, the, and the, the Christian churches over the instrument. The instrument was was just the focus. You know, it's like a divorce. You know, why are you divorcing? Well, you know, because of this. Well, what's the real issue? Uh, we haven't been getting along for the last three years. You know, we picked at each other. OK, so we go back and we see that the disciples of Christ and the churches of Christ didn't really separate over the instrument. They separate over a lot of issues, socioeconomic issues, issues of the war. Issues that we wouldn't sit down and talk about things. Issues that we were, you know, bitter and angry. Issues that, you know, we were getting into. They were getting into theological liberalism, and we were trying to hold to the faith. You know, a lot of factors there, and the instrument just tends to be the one we we tag, and then we tell everybody else it's over the instrument without knowing the whole the whole fight. Um, <clears throat> if we view the movement as a whole, we see a lot of ideas that were designed to try to help us to reawaken to the way of God. And so the historian's job is not to judge, and that's not my job here. Um, voices are not rebels or dissenters, but sometimes they're prophetic. Sometimes they're concerned about things. The movement changes, not because truth changes, but because movement is a human attempt to find and learn about God. And again, the, you know, back in 1987 with Doug Arthur's statement about uh, remembering the poor, how uh, the International Church of Christ, uh, the Boston movement, as, as they were called back then, said, hey, we need to be taking care of the poor. You know, are we going to look back in 1986 and say they're ungodly because they weren't taking care of the poor? You just needed a prophet to call you to it. And you, you, you responded. And 
you know, hope is a great program there. What are some of the things that have caused us to open our eyes to the thing? Movement is based upon growth, learning, and unity. Movement acknowledges it makes mistakes rather than blaming everybody else. The movement matures from generation to generation. So that's where we are. And then we're way down on one of the pages that say 19... I want to back up and do 1910 to 1950, and then we'll go on, pick up with 1950. Funny thing is, we had to do 400 years in the first session. Now we're only going to do 60. Okay, so I'll talk real slow. (laughs) But actually, I want to, to shut down my part at about... Ten after, a quarter after, and then give you time to answer, ask questions because I, I think you may have some questions. This is not going to be a complete history. Um, you know, we're going to try to just look at some things as we scatter along. Uh, my area is basically biblical studies and theology, but you know, a lot of the stuff I've, I've studied, and, I, and um, I won't know every writing if you ask me a question, but I'll let you know. Um, you can you can email me, and I'll get that to you. And so I'm going to try to just give you a, a quick perspective. You know, from from differing views. All right. So first of all, 1910, we actually were talking about some of the struggles that were going on in in America. World War One and World War Two uh, you know, gave us an interesting perspective about the world. You know, we used to fight battles on our own country in the Civil War. But when we went over to Germany and fought the bad guys and we went over to uh, who we didn't have to see after the battle and went over to Germany and fought Hitler found out what Hitler was doing to the Jews, which, by the way, Martin Luther mentioned in his tract that Jews should be killed and tortured. So, you know, Hitler was just a religious fanatic. But uh, nevertheless, we went over, we went over, excuse me, we went over to Germany and, and, and suddenly we were seeing the world from a different perspective. You know, we were seeing that that America is a pretty good place. Uh, America's got a lot of potential. America can bind together and fight the bad guy. We can do all kinds of things. We can create, you know, planes and, you know, and here the Japanese come in and they, they'll, they'll bomb Pearl Harbor, but yet we're able to respond with this great military force and conquer the world. And so World War I and World War II gave us a, a world perspective about what was going on in other countries. It began the system after World War II of NATO, uh, United Nations, Uh, And it also gave us a global perspective of life. Suddenly, it's more important uh, to think about the world than it is just about our own country. Uh, We saw ourselves as as a nation that was pretty bad. You know, nobody's going to mess with us and we'll take them on. We're not afraid. We rebuilt this country. We were able to to build huge buildings and able to do uh, tremendous things in in the workforce. And so we were able to do that in other countries. Uh, Missionary works in other countries took off. Um, Italy was a great place. The Payton brothers who... Uh, for, uh, worked with Sunset School of Preaching, uh, still do. Uh, man, the Payton brothers went and took on the Pope in uh, Italy. Had their car bombed by the mafia. You know, all kinds of stuff went on. Suddenly we began to realize that uh, we can take these people on. We are not afraid of anything. And so missions throughout uh, the 40s and the 50s were a tremendous area for the Church of Christ. Started a, Went over to Tokyo, helped rebuild Tokyo, started a Christian college over there. The Christian colleges in America were growing and being becoming powerful. Um, we were planning churches in the Northeast with the Exodus movement. I mean, America was a force to be reckoned with, and American Christianity and the churches of Christ, the um, disciples of Christ, the restoration movement, it was a force to be reckoned with. We were becoming the fastest growing Protestant religion in the country and in the world, and it was a great time to be alive. Um, everything seemed to be clicking well for us. It, the church was just like our country. It was going abroad and conquering foes. It was going. It was staying at home and working out a lot of problems. And it was a it was a wonderful time for us. But again, we were in a sense mapping a little bit of what was going on in in the world. Part of that uh, part of that growth then caused us to look within ourselves a little bit. Um, a lot of the rural uh, churches were growing and taking off, and you know, well before Pink Floyd said it. Uh, uh, we said it. Hey, teacher, leave them preachers alone. We don't need no schools. Uh, we don't need no stinking schools. I mean, we we can educate ourselves. And so this uh, what was begun by Elder Ben Franklin in 1826, the discussion over whether we should have uh, schools to train our preachers. Uh, Franklin was upset because, man, these guys are coming out. They're speaking over our head. You know, they're they're doing their valedictory uh, addresses in Greek, as I mentioned earlier and they're going to farmers and preaching and I mean what what is the point of all this and Bethany College and, and it was continuing to grow well um, D.A. Summers took up the the battle cry for the 
uh, you know, non-educated system. D.A. Summers was a student at Bethany. He had a, a reading disability that I picked up from one of his journals. Uh, he was faced with taking a final or going out and preaching a one-week gospel meeting. He chose the meeting. I'd rather baptize a lot of people than get a theological education. And then after summer uh, began to, you know, you know, go on in that d- discussion and it began to decrease, Carl Ketcherside was the guy that picked that up. Carl Ketcherside was a great speaker, uh, had a business degree. Uh, I met Carl Ketcherside in Missouri. Wonderful older man, uh, great guy, powerful speaker. Guy went to Harvard University, spoke to the students. Professors of theology were hanging on his every word. Uh, Carl Ketcherside could, could wow anybody. Carl Ketcherside was a great debater. Never knew where he stood, but he'd cut you down whatever side he chose. Uh, guys who I knew, a couple elders I served with, said uh, Carl Ketcherside's idea of a class was, you pick an issue and I'll debate it. You know, that was their Wednesday night class. Um, Carl Ketcherside was the great champion of the non-educated minister system. What Carl Ketcherside believed in was that everybody should have their Timothys. You take the young... Uh, young person, you train them as an evangelist, you send them out and they plant churches. And the evangelist preaches in the churches. And the evangelist's goal is not only to preach to the lost, but to appoint elders. And once you get elders in, those guys take over the preaching. The evangelist goes from congregation to congregation. And Carl Ketcherside was against the Christian colleges because, first of all, it educated these guys, you know, and they weren't going to be of any value in the, in the churches. Carl Ketcherside was against educational institutions because it was just another institution to control the church. And so these movements, uh, you know, 100 member congregations were popping up all over in the rural uh, Midwest and then later throughout the United States. Carl Ketcherside was championing the view uh, Ben Franklin and D.A. Summers had that we don't need to have educated ministers um, in the sense of a formal education. They can be trained, they can be developed. As time went on, Carl Ketcherside developed evangelistic oversight. The evangelist appoints elders, the evangelist is over the elders, and the five or six congregations where he was. And pretty soon the evangelist had a lot of control over the churches and the elders. It wasn't about delegating responsibility to the elders. It was about controlling what went on. Carl Ketcherside was in countless debates with located preachers about whether a church should have a located preacher. Now, why I think that this is a significant part of our history as we look at the post-World War II issues is because, you know, coming from the rural, rural Midwest, it, it created a sense of, of, of thinking among our churches. Uh, that sense of, of, of thinking in our churches was that we can study the Bible for ourselves. We can know the Bible for ourselves. We don't need to have a theologian. And it was a very valid point. I mean, you, you, you get a guy that comes in and he starts speaking over everybody's head. Why are you going to have him? You know? uh, another valid point that Carl Ketcherside said is when the minister becomes the pastor, the elders don't shepherd. That was a very valid point. I mean, you know, I mean he, he, his voice still sounds today, even though he's dead. His voice still sounds in my ears. You know? uh, one, of my, one of my important jobs is to train and develop elders, and our elders are great. And they're great because they shepherd. I get to be an evangelist and preach and, and proclaim. And we work together. And they shepherd me. But Carl Ketcherside's voice keeps ringing. You know, when the elders become a board of directors, they are useless in a congregation. Um, sad thing is, a lot of those congregations began to decline until about 20 people. And their first thought was, we need to have a preacher or we're going to die. And then the men who fought so hard as elders to teach and preach did delegate it to ministers, and those ministers did become pastors. I worked in a church like that where it was so hard to get the elders to do stuff, they had become comfortable, and Carl's words had been fulfilled in a sense. But, you know, Carl Ketcherside was also against um, orphans' homes, um, said that it took the place of, of the church. Uh, but the, in the debates, the question was always asked, how many orphans are you raising, Carl? <laughs> well, that's not the point, you know. <laughs> uh, you know and, and Carl Ketcherside, again, was not only with the colleges, but Carl Ketcherside brought a sense, a sense in the churches of Christ that said we need to reach the common person. And while Carl Ketcherside in history, along with Leroy Garrett, who got his Ph.D. at Harvard and turned around and wrote for the same movement, uh, and Ben Franklin and D.A. Summers, while they've been seen as a schism of the church, they were crying out to say, you know, we need people who talk to common everyday individuals. We need people who can preach a sermon with meat in it, you know, rather than just a pep rally, but yet meat that people can chew, you know. 
You know, we don't need them giving them a porterhouse steak when they're only ready for a hot dog. If you count a hot, I'll say a kosher hot dog. That is meat there. <laughs> and, and, and so, the, you know, Carl Ketcherside's voice was a great voice. You know, what are we doing with our churches? This was carried on in, in the later 70s with the creation of preaching schools. You know, I mean, again, Abilene Christian and Harding, uh, you know, they were turning out these, these guys with Masters of Divinities. And, and, you know, again, they were way over people's heads. So the preacher training schools were a response to that. Let's get a guy, a family, let's train both of them together, put them through two years and send them into the congregations. A, a great voice, a great voice of, of, of reason, a great voice for a call, for action, yet an important voice in our churches. Some have called them you know, rebels and dissenters, uh, dissenters and heretics. And there were things that we can look and say, yeah, they were a problem. But they were calling out for the church to be concerned about the little people, you know, and not get over everyone's heads. And so in the churches of Christ, that kind of battle was going on. In the disciples of Christ, there was still the continued battle of liberalism. Uh, the issues of ordaining women in, in, in the pulpit, the issues, again, of, of theologians who spoke above their people, the issues of social, you know, having people that are snobby and so much more wealthier than everybody. And the cry among the disciples of Christ and the Christian churches were, hey, you, you've forgotten the common person. Both movements were studying with the, struggling with the same thing. It was just at a different level. And what was exciting about it was in 1910 to 1950 and, and onward is we saw a nation of people that said, I can learn the Bible for myself. You know. So give me a reason to study on. It was the, the statement of a people, I need meat, but I don't need so much meat that I can't understand what I'm eating. You see, I want to chew my meat and enjoy it. You see, uh, it, it, was a, it was a nation of people that were screaming out to learn. We have confidence in who we are as a nation. We can learn. The great things out of this, man, I saw elders who would read Josephus, learn a little bit of Greek. I saw elders reading Eusebius, and I thought, wow. You know, guys that worked in the field would come in and read, uh, read about church history, and there was a great explosion at this time of knowledge among the people. And, man, people were wanting to study their Bibles. Uh, people were learning from themselves. Uh, men were given the opportunity to stand up and preach. Women were given the opportunity to teach uh, you know, women's classes. And everybody was given the opportunity to teach it was a great movement. It brought back a great concept of people understanding and learning the Bible for themselves. But the negative of it was, if you're not a preacher, you know, there's a reason God's not gifted you with that, you see. And pretty soon after a while, the sermons became the same old thing, shallow sermons. Uh, men, I remember stories of men breaking out in hives before they would preach because they were scared to preach. I mean, if, if that's not what God's called you to do. You don't have to do that. You can glorify God in some other way. And many of these churches were trying to force people into a mold, and so they saw a tremendous decline in the 60s when uh, the hippie generation, nobody's going to tell us what to do, you see. And so we move into the 50s to the 70s, and we begin to see a lot of issues that young people in churches were wanting to deal with. While the church has been arguing about doctrine, while the church has been trying to redefine itself, while the church has been trying to say, why are we different than the Baptists? Why are we different than the Pentecostals? While the church understood in that time of growth why we were better than everybody else, the issues of racism and Vietnam and social justice and poverty and a government that can't be trusted began to be on the minds of people. And the 60s and the 70s were a time when people began to ask questions. And the church really didn't know what to do with this. I mean, we hadn't empowered people. We, we, we taught them to learn on their own, but we hadn't empowered them to think for themselves. Our leadership, our elder development was based upon a war model. Commander says something, you obey. Well, what if I don't agree? That's not in our list of options that I just gave you, is there? You see. And what happened is in the 60s and 70s, just like in so many denominations, so many of our people left the churches of Christ uh, because we failed to, to address issues like racism. Much like in the 1840s when... Uh, Alexander Campbell and Ben Franklin refused to address the issues of slavery because it wasn't, in their mind, a biblical issue. We were doing the same thing with racism. Martin Luther King was at the forefront of preaching. Our African-American brothers and sisters uh, had been preaching and writing and proclaiming and challenging us and even questioning whether we were really churches of Christ uh, because we had African-Americans worshiping in the basement, because uh, at one point African-Americans were not even allowed into our schools. And letters such as this one 
to A.M. Burton, who was a man who gave 90% of his income to the Lord. Mr. Burton, it has been brought to our attention that you have intentions of purchasing the St. Cecilia Academy property for the purpose of using it as a school for Negroes. As elders of this congregation and residents of this community, we view with concern the use of this property as a center for Negroes. There are five white congregations of the Church of Christ in this vicinity. We feel our congregation and also the others would be crippled in a short time because of the loss of much of our present membership and the hostility of the public to the Church of Christ if this Negro school were established. We want you to understand that our opposition is not personal. No. We would oppose the present owners of any successors thereto if they should attempt the establishment of a Negro project. Signed, the 12th Avenue Church of Christ Elders, May 8, 1953. Foy Wallace, well known in the 1940s as a great Bible expositor, a man who contended for the faith and tried to call us back to being what God has called us to be. Man, it was a great debater with the denominations. Foy Wallace in March 1941 of Bible Banner berated whites who attended Negro meetings and praised black preachers for their work. He concluded by saying, if any of the white brethren get worked up over what I've said and want to accuse me of being jealous of the Negro preachers, I will just tell them now that I don't even want to hold a meeting for any bunch of brethren who think that any Negro is a better preacher than I am. And yeah, there's, there's a dark hour in the, quote, traditional churches of Christ. It's a time when racism wasn't even addressed. We were reading the same Bible that Paul wrote. We were reading the same passages. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free. you know. But somehow we weren't getting the point across. And then in 1961, Carl Spain standing up at the ACU's lec- ACU lectures, a scholar there, stood up and said, God forbid that churches of Christ and schools operated by Christians shall be the last stronghold of refuge for socially sick people who have Nazi illusions about the master race. I feel certain that Jesus would say, you hypocrites, you say you're the only true Christians and make up the only true church and have the only Christian schools, yet you drive one of your own preachers to denominational schools Or he can get credit for his work, but you won't let him take the Bible for credit here at Abilene because of the color of his skin. We have become moral cowards. Carl Spain was almost fired for these statements, but Abilene Christians stuck with him. They began to admit African Americans, and Abilene Christian became the first school to do that. It's interesting that that's a tension that went on in the churches of Christ. In in my perspective over restoration history, that may be the very first time that the churches of Christ failed to do what was going on in the government world. All along I've been saying, just as our country's done this, as our country's done this, we've done this. This was the one time where the Church of Christ failed to address the racism like our country was addressing it. Not that it's been solved in our country, but it's interesting that we resisted it. Mission Magazine, the one that came out of New York, uh, was uh, constantly criticizing uh, the church for neglecting this issue. A commentary called Pseudo Amos was written. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of the churches of Christ and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they sell the inner city for suburban sanctuaries and the ghetto for heated baptistries or soft lights. They that trample the head of the indigents and the immigrants turn aside the way of the addicts and the alcoholics. Hear the word that the Lord has spoken against you, O churches of Christ. You only have I known of all the churches of the earth. Therefore, I'll punish you for your iniquities. Woe to us who sit on padded pews and relax ourselves on theater seats who sing spiritual ditties without the sound of harp, and unlike David, who did not invent for ourselves instrument of music, who drink Welch's grape juice in individual cups and anoint ourselves with the finest cosmetics, but are not grieved over the ruin of our people. Therefore, we shall now be the first to go into exile, and the revelry of those who are relaxed shall pass away. Ah, pseudo Amos. Should be in the Bible sometimes, I think. Wonderful commentary. But Mission Magazine was leading the front in criticizing African American congregations were were constantly challenging, uh, you know, challenging us to focus. Marshall Keeble, one of the most well known African American preachers in the churches of Christ, was one of those who you know, he he could he could talk. Everybody loved him. He could talk to anybody, and he would stand before a, a, a congregation of white uh, uh, Christians, and, and his African American brothers and sisters were in the back, and he'd say, you know, we'll go on ahead and submit. We'll worship in the basement. You do what we're asked, but. We'll overcome the devil, you know. And he'd look at the white Christians. And he's the only one that could get away with that. I mean, he, he had a way of looking at white Christians and challenging us uh, in such a gentle way. Great man that started a Nashville Bible School, uh, a great preaching college for African-American preachers. Uh, wonderful man. 
uh, chose to be passive, about, passive aggressive about the way they were going to overcome. Uh, singing, we shall overcome, believing that there would be a sense of unity uh, among whites and blacks. And yet when he died, many people grieved. But yet there were so many voices going on saying, we are not fit to be called a church of Christ if we're racist. You know, and, and challenging us and the response. People like Ira North, uh, one of the biggest congregations in the churches of Christ, chose not to be involved. Uh, chose not to, be, not to write for Mission Magazine because he didn't want to rock the boat. And I understand why he did that. He's a well-known, loved brother in our, in our churches of Christ. But yet he chose not to take this issue on. So many of the ministers from the bigger churches chose to just avoid Mission Magazine. Others condemned Mission Magazine. And I'm, there are other issues that were being promoted there, but they focused on that. Mission Magazine is a heresy. Mission Magazine is calling us to leave the faith rather than addressing the issues. Mission Magazine's got some good points, and we need to reflect on who we are. And so there was much tension over racism in the churches of Christ. And yet, the churches of Christ began to train people to do urban missions. Urban ministry began to take off. Joy bus ministries began to grow. Campus ministries began to take off in the 60s and the 70s. And yet, and higher education began to grow again. But we never wanted to address the racism issue, and it was absent from our pulpits. And again, as we look along, the voices of the prophets were calling us, calling us to change, calling us to repent. And yet, in some way, we weren't paying attention to them. And so as the churches of Christ struggled to find who they were, people left the church because we weren't addressing issues. And the disciples of Christ, they were leaving the disciples of Christ because they too were not addressing the socioeconomic issues that they were facing. And the question was, is God still among us? And people were trying to hang on. Others were listening. Others were tuning them out. So we come to the 70s through, as I would say, 2000, uh, 2001, or not 2001, to 2000. And we begin to see you know, other things forming in the churches of Christ. As the churches of Christ emphasize on bringing people back, trying to, to change the way we did worship, trying to change the way that we did evangelism, things like the campus ministries began to grow. And you know, that's where we begin to see Chuck Lucas with uh, the, the ministry at Gainesville, Florida, known as, uh, I think, the Crossroads Church of Christ. And the discipling movement began to grow. Uh, there was a desire in the churches of Christ to gain those back who we had lost. There was a desire in the churches of Christ to address the issues that were raised in the 60s and the 70s. There was a desire in the church of Christ to evangelize. We'd lost people. And, and the people were crying out, we need to be evangelistic. It was a valid criticism. Uh, our young people were going off to colleges and experiencing pluralism. You know, the, the worship of many gods. They were exper- exposed to so many different, um, you know, the Quran and, and, and uh, Jewish faith and ex- experientialism. Uh, our young people were getting, you know, experimenting with drugs. And we were beginning to say we need to call these people back. Many of the people of the 60s, the hippies as they were called, uh, who had children. They wanted to come back home. And just as Wade uh, Clark Roof mentions in his book on the baby boomers, baby boomers were returning to more conservative religions. The Church of Christ was one of those because people wanted to, again, bring their children up knowing about God. And so from 70 to 2000, there was a great explosion in urban missions, ministry, uh, youth ministry. Youth ministry took on a new form. Media was important, you know. What's, you know, how are we going to get these kids fired up about Jesus? Uh, college programs began to have youth ministry degrees and urban missions degrees and campus ministries. Uh, the, uh, it's now known to you all, the International Churches of Christ. Um, I was converted in 83, and, and, and so I kind of followed uh, the International Churches of Christ for quite a while. And one of the things that I always appreciated was the call to evangelism. You know, we needed to get right with God. We needed to become evangelistic. We needed to respond. And, oh, I don't know. Uh, I think at some point, somewhere over there, it was maybe maybe like a divorce. I don't know. At some point, there was a parting of the ways. And I think what happened is a person that observed, is a person that tried to, that, that had friends in, in, in uh, the Boston movement. I think sometimes we weren't willing to listen. And I think sometimes we weren't willing to talk. And I think both of us just said, see you later. It's a big world. We'll go on our way. That was unfortunate because, uh, in, in a way, um, there was so much we could have learned. And I think that there was so much that you know, could have been learned by uh, the Boston movement. And yet, yeah, unless we walked our ways. Um, 
positive things of that, uh, being back here in, in the church, the mainline churches of Christ, we became more evangelistic. We talked about evangelism. We pushed evangelism. But we also saw that evangelism has to do with confronting our, our government structures and being a little more prophetic. And so we were challenged to grow. We were challenged in some areas. As our society began to get involved in Internet and globalization, we were forced to look at world missions. 1984 was the first year that black and brown Christians from a you know, world missions definition outnumbered white Christians. And so we began to realize that Africa and South America were places that had a deep longing for God. And so we began to see missions on, on both sides, with the International Churches of Christ and the Churches of Christ, and also with the Disciples of Christ and the Christian churches, Africa and South America became a target for many of the ministries and world missions. Great hearts were being won uh, there. Great souls were being encouraged. And great churches were being planted in there. Internet and globalization was making us constantly aware of where people were. And as a church, we began to respond. Uh, our theological uh, portion of the um, mainline churches of Christ uh, has done tremendous work in becoming a force in the Society of Biblical Literature. Uh, Alexander Campbell and that mo the Restoration Movement is now being included in many of the histories of American evangelism. Uh, we have forced uh, the, American, the Evangelical Theological Society to take Alexander Gam Campbell and Barton Stone's teachings seriously. There's been, in the scholarly community, a great emphasis at uniting, in a sense, the Christian churches and the churches of Christ through the Stone Campbell Journal and Restoration Quarterly. While we're not in agreement on everything, we do understand that theologically we need to call our churches to get involved in dealing with scholarship issues. Uh, many of our ministers in these churches have published commentaries that have been well respected in the scholarly community. Um, we have been able to stand up and say that the churches of Christ are a community that have a strong biblical foundation and have earned respect in the scholarly community. Many of our uh, scholars are teaching in, in major seminaries throughout the world. While, again, all of them will say, I don't agree with everything that's taught here, they are being an influence at challenging people to think at a higher level. On the other hand, in the rural area, many of the churches are continuing to grow in the restoration movement, reaching and empowering people to deal with social issues. In a sense, we've learned a lesson from the voices of the 60s and the 70s. And so we come to the year 2001 to today. And so we ask the question, what's the future of the restoration movement? Well, I think the best question to ask is maybe right here. You know, what is our future uh, as I guess, as I spent some time in prayer asking myself, why am I here? Uh, why have I been asked to speak with the potential of, you know, if like other churches of mainline churches of Christ using this as a platform to point the finger? Obviously, God says this is a chance to talk about what our futures are. Unfortunately, in the past, we've parted ways and gone on. Um, I know I followed what's going on in the ICOC uh, the Henry Crete letter and the developments within many of the churches and the dialogue and the talking. And so we're asking the question as mainline churches, what's the future for all of us? Is there a chance to come back together and reconcile and talk and learn from each other? Uh, many people in the mainline churches of Christ have said that the things that have been said in the last uh, few months among the ICOC have been stuff that we've been saying 10 years ago. Uh, others have said, you know, international who? Others have said they'll never amount to anything. In the mainline churches of Christ, there is great hope and great questioning and great excitement about some of the things that are being talked about here at this conference and even in, in the international churches of Christ. And we are a people who have said, you know, maybe we got upset with some things. Maybe we didn't listen to the voice of prophets. Maybe we were a prophet that didn't feel we were being listened to. But the point is we can come together and talk. What's our futures? Where are we going? Ultimately, the great question that was once asked when the churches of Christ, the disciples of Christ all began, was, is it possible to have unity? Is it possible to preach Jesus? Is it possible for us to come together and say, let's work together because we want to do, have a common goal? Be united together and win people to Jesus Christ. We want to throw off creeds. We want to not be influenced so much by our government. We want to throw away uh, the, the power structures that keep us from feeling our freedom in Christ. We want to be united. We want to share our faith. We want all people to feel that they can be empowered to be men and women of God who rise up together and help lead a world caught in slavery to freedom. And so that's the questions that we ask. 
2001 to today are questions. And the next century hopefully will answer a lot of those questions. Hopefully Monday will answer a lot of those questions. Uh, Where will we go as a movement? Um, There's just as much excitement from the mainline churches of Christ at our future as there is excitement for you all. There's just as many questions that we're asking. We've got people that irritate us. We've got people that we irritate. We've got uh, sometimes division among us. We've got questions we want answered. But we all need to sit down and talk about issues. And maybe that's the great hope for the future. I appreciate what Chip said last night about building bridges. You know, hopefully that can happen. But that will again take unity. That will again take commitment. That will again be like the divorce where the couple set part their ways and they come back and say, before we can reconcile, there must be peace. Before we can reconcile, there must be unity. And in reconciliation, we understand that we must listen, we must talk, but it all must be based on a belief that we love each other as God loves us. So I'm going to leave it open now to questions. Um, While this is not a complete history, it was kind of an attempt at it. What questions do you have? As we scan through 50 years. Yes. Um, I'll try to answer your question this time, okay? No, you were okay last time. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I, my impression uh, is, or I guess my impression of so the traditional church is that it seems like in general um, there, there's a little bit, they're a little bit less unified, there's a little bit because maybe the In my thinking of, of you know unified, being unified, I mean, I do feel unified, you know, pretty much. If, if they obviously if they're the same beliefs, I yeah. mean, to embrace you know someone from from the traditional church or disciples of Christ or some other offshoot. Um, but at the same time, because it, it seems like there's a little more division um, in maybe traditional churches or some of the other, you know. That there some I know that there are some traditional or maybe you know other churches that have sort of gone the way of maybe easy believism or you know I, I, I'm not saying that you know they're not unified where you what you and I believe and there's a so just in unifying ourselves it's kind of you know yeah yeah um, <coughs> unity is a pro- yeah unity is a process I, I go back to Hezekiah you know here's Hezekiah he he has this really uh, bad attempt at a Passover and he can't completely do the Passover because the priests aren't clean and it's in 2 Kings but, but he invites people from the northern kingdom which strictly had cut off God they were, they were into Baal worship uh, uh, they had gold calf you know, at places and yet Hezekiah invites these people to come and he says you know we got something in common the Passover that God freed us from the bondage in Egypt and if we can begin there we can talk and you know, I, I just I guess I look at that and, and that's that was where unity began is let's let's find something we have in common. Let's begin there and see where it goes. Um, there's some things that are never going to be possible. You know, I can't uni- unite with a Muslim and I'm probably going to unite with uh, some of the Pentecostals on some some theology with baptism. But I can at least start somewhere and then we see where it goes. So I think unity has to begin somewhere. And unity has to be committed to saying, well, let's talk about it and see if this is a process that can happen. So, you know, I think if, if, I, if I say um, this isn't going to happen, it will never happen. If I say let's start uh, and let's talk and let's just see what happens. And if it happens, you know, ten years from now, you know, I may think, you know, it's not a big issue to me now like it was then. Because maybe I've grown, maybe I've realized as I've studied that, you know, that's not a big issue. So I, I guess I'm saying I think it begins with talking about it and seeing where it goes. I hope I answered your question. Okay, question in the back. Yeah. Well, I think, think just in line with what the gentleman was saying is I think that you know, I've been around for a while and I think we've assumed that within the churches, the international church of Christ, there's been this unity. Well, there really hasn't. I mean, we've seen that as soon as you take the, you know, the authority out of the way, look at the unity we, unity we have today. There, there's such a, a, a disunity that we're fighting to just bring our own movement back together. But, um, you know, and, and I think that you know, as we've been around, we've always, just, you know, though we haven't said out loud, sort of believe that we are the true movement and we're the committed, whereas the traditional churches is not, the, you know, they're not committed, therefore it's kind of us and them. I think it's sort of a humbling 
know, yeah. on our part to realize that, you know what, we're really not all that committed without the authority in place. Uh, I guess at the same time, I guess my question is, maybe is, and I'm trying to form this into a question, you know, take an observation, make a question out of it. What do you see? I mean, as far as, you know, looking at both sides, it sounds like you became a, a Christian about the same time the movement was getting going. What do you see as far as, you know, is this the seeds of God sort of bringing the, the two back together and what are the next steps? Or? Um, yeah, I think uh, I think I see that. I see God uh, moving. I, think, I mean, I, I know Satan's been involved. But I know if you resist the devil, he'll flee from you. And I think sometimes God allows Satan to have power because God says you need to learn something. And so I think we've been knocked just as hard in our lack of evangelism. And God's had to slap us upside the head and say, you know, you, know, you can learn something from these people. And you, you turned around and you, you called them a cult and you branded them. You know, when they, you know. So what do I see? I, I see God working to say, come back together and talk about it. Um, what, what's been clear in my life is just the fact Kip McKean answered the phone. You know, when I met him in April, he said, hey, I want you to speak. On this, I thought, you don't even know me. You know, well, I've heard of you. I thought, you know, that's, a, that, you know, and people would say, you know, it's kind of risky going there. I thought, it's just as risky having me here, yeah. you know. Uh, but, but, you know, I feel like I've been invited to somebody's house, and so I'm just sitting and visiting, enjoying the fellowship. And when I leave, uh, people are going to say, what's going on? I'm going to say, yeah, I've just had a great time, and we're talking. So, so I think God's moving that way, but I think it causes us to go, let's talk and let's listen. You know, rather than I'll go out and call, you know, Oklahoma Christian and tell them all this stuff. So, yeah. question uh, I think both um, I think th- yeah I have to think about that a little more I, I mean because you know I, I don't want to answer that I don't want to answer that the wrong way and I haven't really thought that through unity I mean I think we all have a purpose in our unity and what, are, what has God called us to do um, how, where's our unity, unity where's our, our unity of fellowship it should be with our brothers and sisters, first of all, in our congregations, right? But I think as we begin to look at who we are, um, you know, where have we come from? Well, you know, it, you know, in the 80s, we kind of went our separate ways. How about going back and let's unite, let's unite together in that and talk about that? And then let's look along. Are there other people that we've broken off with that we can talk with, promote unity and healing through our life? It's kind of like a person that um, they're getting ready to die and they go back and start making amends with all the people they've made enemies with. Some people are so far gone, you know, they're into drugs. I can't, but I've, I've made amends with anything. And so they make attempt at finding who's, who's kind of similar to them. And I'm probably not answering that because I haven't thought through that. But I hope I answered it <laughs> enough for you. To, you know, yeah, that's a tough question, I guess. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess the person coming along at this stage, you probably look back and go, I didn't know we needed unity. And I guess speaking as a person who's been back here at this stage and looking at the whole movement, we were always working together, but we kept splitting off of each other and fighting and arguing instead of staying together. Yeah, that's we were. Yeah. Is unity of fellowship versus unity of purpose? I'd say unity of fellowship then, I think, there. I'm going to listen to the CD and go, man, what was I thinking? Okay. It's okay. <laughs> well, I, I hear you saying that in watching the ICMC, the mainline churches, have learned a lot about evangelism. What do you wish 
Good question. Um, I think I, I think the, the understanding I have is issues of power and control and leadership. I think would be when I when I read Henry Crete's letter. Um, I think the four things that he mentioned, I think a lot of us were going, yeah. I mean, he's bringing up things that I think people saw, but it was just finally put together. I, I don't know, not being in this, but I think the main one would be the issue of, of power and control and leadership. Um, I think was was one issue that seems to jump out. Um, another one, I think, is the, uh, I think the one-on-one discipling partner. We're, we're still not convinced that that's biblical. And I know that you know, that's more to study about, but um, I think the uh, I think those are probably probably two that we've we've questioned, and we want to study about it. I think, and I, and I think, but and I don't want to say things that cause people to go, ah, oh, you know, I need to go back and question things. I'm just saying that these are where our perspectives were, and and the real issue is going to be, you know, are those things that you're seeing, and if those are things you're seeing, let's come together and talk. You've been clear about what what we lack. And I think we've been working on it, you know, in the last 10 years. I can say, and you know, as a teacher, uh, that we've been working on that. We have been pushing evangelism. We've been concerned about that uh, poverty issues. I mean, we've really tried to work hard on those. And I've always said I learned so much, you know, from 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 these guys. And that's why I've been frustrated when people start using the term cult. I just get all upset because I think, you know, no, you know, it's it's just it, it's two movements that just. You know, like Paul and Barnabas, maybe in a way, just said, "Okay, we got to go." And maybe we've come around to where we said, "Hey, let's talk." You know, you've helped us; we want to help you. Let's let's work together. So I think, you know, hopefully, that's been helpful there. Yeah. Hey Ron, what, uh, how, how are your, your congregation? How well do you work together with other churches of Christ? What, what vehicles do you guys use to work together? Um, this is what I'm hearing. We, every year we do a thing called Together with Love and Christ. Last Sunday in October we have a, a unity worship here at, at the convention center. And we have probably 2,000 people there. So there's about 25 churches of Christ in Portland, Vancouver area. Every, you know, we've had uh, Marvin Phillips and all of these guys speak. And every one of them have come and spoke and said, this is the most unified I've ever seen churches of Christ in a city. I feel as churches of Christ, you know, and... I've been chairman of the TLC committee, and I work with the preachers' meetings. I feel we have a great spirit. I mean, there's a couple of churches that think they're the only ones that are right. But we, I think, feel we have a very great spirit. We disagree on stuff, but we're committed to working together as Churches of Christ um, to continue outreach. Uh, we've planted a church in Clackamas County, and then an urban ministry planning has gone on. We've sent our... Uh, Metro has, started, you know, has helped to start 15 churches in Albania. Our, our singles minister has gone over... Tom Bonner used to be an elder at the Montreal Church of Christ, I think, at one time. So I think as, as churches, we all work very well together as ministers. And we disagree, but we try to encourage each other and challenge each other. Yeah. Um, we have to give and take, you know, on some things. I mean, we're struggling, um, you, know, the, you know, a couple of churches... You know, the women's issue came up with one of the churches. And what bothered us was that the minister came in and said, this is what we're doing. And then they never showed up to another preacher's meeting. And we said, you know, come talk about it. We don't agree with this, but we want to talk about it. Um, you know, we have some churches with praise teams and some that don't. And, you know, we've just learned to say we're going to have to bend and, and get along on some of this. Um, if it's a real serious issue, we talk about it. But I think we found that, that there's really nothing that's that serious um, with us. So I think the more we talk, the more we find that, you know, hey, it's not such a bad issue. I mean, I think we can work with that. So, I, you know, if you live in Portland, it's one of the few cities, from what I'm hearing from other people, that has a very great unity with the ministers here. That's awesome. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Um, I, I know baptism and conversion is one of the things that's a big discussion now among the mainline churches. Uh, what, what do you see in terms of the challenges? I think it's terminology. I've watched, you know, somebody may say, I believe I was baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Another person may say, I was baptized to be born again. And I've watched us argue about it. And I think there's a lot of terminology, and I think we're concerned about at what point did the person believe. I think if we've backed off as we've backed off here, we've all said we believe that, you know, you've got to be baptized to become a Christian. And we acknowledge that. Uh, you know, other people, you know, some are using different terminology, and we're wrestling with at what point, but we have all said kind of the same thing. 
And so, um, okay, yeah. Does that help? <laughs> What are, you, what are you thinking, I guess? Well, I just, I know all the way from Max Licato. Yeah. You know, viewpoint to the old, you know, very legalistic. Yeah. And this, well, the book is on this uh, spectrum. Yeah. Views on that. And just at the lectures, I was, I was amazed to see the variety of convictions and the conversion that didn't used to be there. Yeah. And I'm wondering, uh, I'm wondering how much of that, like Mike Cope said, I wonder if it's a phase people go through. I'm, I'm watching preachers go through this phase where they question it, and we ride their back rather than back off and say, let's study about it and talk about it. And I've watched them come out of it. But I, I think we're, we're all on edge about that. And I think we make it more tense than it is rather than backing off and saying, but don't you believe that a person's not saved till they're baptized? Well, and I'm finding a lot will say, yeah. They're just questioning terminology. Um, and so and I think the Lord's going to have to take care of that. But um, I believe that you're not a Christian until you're baptized. Um, so. Amen. so. Okay. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming. I, I really thank you for inviting me. I think it's useful just to hear you because I was baptized in the International Church in Portland six years ago. I, I, I don't know as much, so I appreciate the knowledge. Thanks. Yeah. 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 I think one of the things that you do is just meet with them. Uh, you know, the more we talk with people, the more our relationship stands. And you know, if I love you, you know, if you go to a Baptist church and I love you, at some point our conversation is going to go to baptism. And I found a lot of the people I've noticed in my Christian ministry, uh, many of the people who I've noticed come, you know, I've been able to lead, I guess, to here have not been baptisms. They've been people who've come back from the denominations. And the reason is because once they got to know me, we got to talking about it. And they really weren't angry with the doctrine. They were angry with what somebody did. The only way that came out was in our meeting together, our praying together, our talking. And so I would say keep the relationship up. Keep talking. Um, The doctrinal issues will work out the more we get to talking. Uh, What we do is we don't see them for six months, and then we go back and want to know why they've left. And they're already defensive. They're already defensive. Man, go visit with them. You know, I don't want to talk about church. Let's just watch a football game. Yeah. You know, and and you know, it's just it'll come up. You know, God, uh, God will open that door, and you just keep with the relationship. Jesus was a friend of sinners and tax collectors. I mean, they loved him. Yeah, come on over, Jesus. All right, what do you want to talk about? You know, if the door's open. It's open. So I think that helped relationship and sitting at the table and talking is always important. Yeah. Do you still have uh, programs like Tuesday night Yeah, we do. It's, Metro just had it uh, Tuesday night, and they'll do it again next month. That's very well. They just celebrated their 50th anniversary at uh, Memorial Weekend. Faith Quest still has five, 600 kids uh, in September. Um, it, you know, we, that's the thing. Portland has some great things uh, that go on. It's tremendous, uh, and, and the fellowship is there. We're struggling with African-American congregations um, and just because there's just such a, br- a bridge there that we have to work on and we work hard at it. Um, TLC was translated last year into Albanian and uh, we have a men, a Laotian congregation. It was translated into Albanian and Laotian. This year our TLC will be translated to Spanish, Albanian, and Laotian. So we have significant immigrant communities that come to our unity event that we have. So we're trying to work hard on that and it's, you know, it's going well, I think. But again, patience, you know, it doesn't go fast, but it's it's slowly building. It's taking time, but it's slowly getting there. Yeah. You made mention a little earlier in your talk about what I heard you say was kind of like conflicts of leadership and how they're supposed to be or uh, some of the failures of it. How would you define leadership and then its roles and responsibilities? Well, I, I think uh, Ephesians 4, if you want to turn there, um, I think leadership is a gifted position. 
Um, Ephesians 4. Um, now, I don't think the person is a gift. I think the position is a gift. You know, I'm not the gift, but the position I fulfill as an evangelist is a gift to a church. And in Ephesians 4, you know, Paul talks about uh, uh, you know, Jesus giving gifts, uh, verse 11 of chapter 4. And he mentions you know, some to be apostles, some prophets, evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Um, and again, we understand pastors as elders. Uh, that those are gifts to the church, and they have a purpose. What's the purpose? To prepare God's people for works of service or ministry. Okay, so the body of Christ may be built up till we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. So the purpose of leadership is to prepare the church to do ministry and prepare the church to mature. And so that's how I understand leadership. Um, elders have a gift of shepherding, and the reason I shouldn't be shepherding is that's not my giftedness. I'm a lousy shepherd. I don't have the patience. I'm a great wrestling referee, but I'm, you know, but you know, I can't treat people like I do when I referee. You know, hey, you're out. You may be mad. Soon you're gone. But our elders have a great ship, and so I and I, I, our training is to de- our training is to develop them to shepherd well. So I do everything I can to help them be the best shepherds they can be, and they shepherd so that I can be an evangelist and preach and teach. And so I think leadership has to recognize its gifts and fulfill those gifts to help the body grow. So that's my definition of leadership, is it is a gifted position with a purpose to help the church do ministry and to mature. And when it doesn't do it, um, that's when it, it needs to reflect. So I think I answered what you're saying. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> oh, man. Well, one of the things, um, yeah, let's not mix uniformity with, uh, u- unity with conformity, okay? Um, when I work with an abusive family, there's a sense of unity, but it's not really unity. It's control and conformity, and they do exactly what dad wants. They will not speak against dad. Um, if they do, they're out, and so we deal with the shame factor. Um, being married to a, a woman who um, I love very much, I've learned that I learned quickly within the first week of marriage that unity and conformity were not the same thing. Uh, when I came home and said, hey, I expect the dinner to be on the table, I found out that I was going to have to be a little more tolerant and understanding and that we've learned to work together as a team. You know, unity and conformity are not the same thing. So unity means that how are we going to work together to get this done, recognizing that you're different than I am. And that means I'm going to have to be tolerant about some things that people do. So a church that's moving that way needs to understand unity is not conformity. Unity involves tolerance and patience and working together and humility and sometimes challenge but encouragement and understanding you're going to do it different than I'm going to do it. Now, you know, I mean, there's problems with that, yeah, but understanding that we do things differently. Oh, um. How do you handle when someone comes in or has a, has a very drastic difference? Yeah. We just had a situation with a guy from a really, really narrow, what we would call a narrow-minded Church of Christ. And our elders sat down with him and said, this is the way it is. You're, we love you. You're welcome to be here. Um, but, you know, this is how it is. You'll not cause trouble. And, you know, they gave him the option to leave. And he decided to stay. And you know, he's a little caustic at times. I mean, I, I didn't know I was going to get a sermon critique every week from him on the internet. You know, 
okay, fine. But we understand, you know, we, we've kind of drawn some parameters that we will not cause division in this body. And this is what we as elders, you know, that's what they say. This is what we as elders have decided we need to do. And so I think you have to lay down some ground rules. Uh, you know, at, at least as a congregation, we're going to promote unity. It's okay, you know. Yeah. Okay, no more questions, I think? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we have some uh, parking issues. Uh, we have a couple of cars that are not in the best spot. Um, one is Oregon license plate GKG243. Uh, if that's you, you're in a no parking zone. You can use your car. Uh, second one's Washington license plate 685JNN. You need to feed your meter um, and feed it till 10 p.m. at this point. This is Hey, let me let me say this before you go. Um, two frogs fell in a can of milk, or so I've heard it told. The sides of the can were shiny and steep. The milk was deep and cold. Oh, what's the use? Cried number one. Tis fate, no helps around. Goodbye, my friend. Goodbye, cruel world. And weeping, that little frog drowned. But number two, of sterner stuff, dog paddled in surprise as he wiped his milky brow and dried his milky eyes. I'll swim a while, he said, or or at least I've heard he said. It really wouldn't help the world if one more frog were dead. An hour or two, he swam and kicked and never stopped to mutter, but kicked and swam and swam and kicked and hopped out because he made butter. Okay? <laughs> Let's keep on with this, all right? Thank you. Yeah. Good, how are you? I'm just looking at your shirt. Tom Wright. Yeah, Tom. Yeah. Nice Nisha. The Nighthawks? Those are uh, oh, the Nighthawks. I don't know who they are. My wife just. Oh, we've been going. Oh, really? Yeah, um, the guys up in the inner city, we were talking about the place I'm so tired of hearing where you post modern. Yeah, I'm Eugene. Portland's a great part of Riverside, huh? I think it's a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. There is yeah, we actually moved up from San Diego I think we see more really. uh, about, uh, uh, well, gosh, about a year ago now. Um, I work for a little dot com company. There's actually just two of us. Around the Beyond company. that, I don't think and, we can. Uh, my boss was from it's a nice a little nice suburb of Eugene. I think the and he always wanted to move back. And you know, he kind of talked me into it. And so said, you know, look, they're planning this church there. He's just like, I said, they're planning this church there. Why don't we move up and get out of the you know, busy city of San Diego? And reluctantly, I said, sure. And, you know, we waited for about uh, probably six months for the you know, official planting. So, you know, uh, we were there for a while. But, uh, that's it. So we, you know, miss California, but yeah, it's all good. As long as we